Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this lecture number 12 on this course of the psychology of language. Up till now, uh, we have covered some bit of basics into uh, how language is formed, psychological factors of language, the production and comprehension of language and a little bit about what are words. The topic of interest for today's lecture will be sentences. So, we will focus on sentences and so what are sentences? These are group of words. So, this lecture which is number 12 and number 13 we will be entirely focusing on sentences. What are sentences? What role do they play in language? How they are comprehended? How they are produced? Rules of sentence formation and those kind of issues is what we are uh, going to fo focus in the upcoming lecture as well as in today's lecture. But before we do all this, let us take a short trip to the memory lane and refresh ourselves as to where we started and where we are now. We started the journey by looking at what is language, the basic forms of language which is the animal communication system which is also called the simplest form of language. So, we looked at characteristics of a language like that, we looked at why do we need language and the best way to uh, study that is to study the animal communication system which is a very very basic form of language. We compared that with the idea of human language, we looked at the structure of human language in terms of its phones to the morphemes, then words, sentences, discourse and so on and so forth. We looked at the origin of language, how it all started where exactly can we place ourselves into the language chain and how language started for us non-animals. I would not say human beings, we will say non-animals. So, there we gave examples of the proto-language, the basic form of language, the idea of Pitgin and several other uh, interesting things that we studied there, which focused on how language developed historically. The next section we quickly took a tour into the science of language, the methodologies that we use in language, the design research, how they are conducted in language studies and we also looked at the brain areas which are connected to producing language or which are involved with language in any way. We looked at techniques like EEG and MRI, uh, the fMRI, how these techniques helps us in studying language in a more meaningful way. The next two sections were dedicated to the perception of speech and the production of speech. In perception of speech, we detailed onto the idea of the ear, how the auditory canal perceives speech which is in form of sound waves. We looked at the idea of speech per, uh, perception, then extracting meaning from the perception of speech, articulating of not, not only articulating but also comprehending of uh, the basic speech uh, phones. We looked at models of speech perception, the motor theory and other theories related to it and then we looked at <laughs> how speech perception develops in infants. The next section since it was very related, we saw how speech is produced it's, it's itself and so we looked at the whole idea of the vocal tract of how the vocal tract is made, how it produces speech models of speech production, the learning of language according to uh, the idea of speech perception and then how infants learn this whole uh, process of producing speech. If you refer back to those uh, sections, you will get a more detailed idea of what we did there. 
and then the last three lectures we dedicated to words. Now, words are as I said a way station between the basics of speech production and language. So, it is the way station because words are the point at which the phonological interpretations or the phonological speech stream is converted into a meaningful symbol. So, words are the link between uh, the pronunciation and the symbols. We looked at words, what are words, the anatomy of words, how words express symbols, theories of word uh, production. We looked at how uh, words are uh, processed, how they are interpreted, how they are comprehended and all those issues are what we concerned ourselves in the <coughs> last three lectures. Now, once we have words, these words need to combine with each other in a recursive manner to make a sentence. Single words do not express ourselves or do not let us express ourselves to other people. Now, I can have a thought without language, but for expressing this thought or transmitting this thought to other people, I need language. So, what sentences are, are ex exactly recursive use of words which have been arranged in certain grammatical sequences, so that meanings are transferred or ideas are transferred between people. So, let us start our uh, section on sentences. And so, uh, the most famous psycholinguist Robin Dunbar, he suggests that language actually evolved from gossips. Language they compel us to organize our thoughts into sentences which are basically tidbits of gossip. So, when we do gossip what we actually do is we take words in particular languages, arrange them in sequences so that we can talk freely among each other and express ideas. And the basic of the sentences are the words. Now, technically speaking the sentence is composed of three parts, it has a subject, it has a verb and it has an object. What are sentences? It is a combination of recursive combination of words which expresses ideas. Words do not express ideas or they are not useful for communication, but when these words are combined together and they help us exchange ideas between people that is what sentences are. So, the subject is the who or the who the sentence is about. The subject is the person about which the sentence is. The verb is signifying what the subject, this is called subject, this is called verb and this is called object. What the subject is doing, what act it is doing and the object is who or what the subject is performing the action on. So, any sentence is a subject, the one person about whom the sentence is, the verb <laughs> which defines the action that the subject is taking and the object which is what the subject is exactly doing. Now, unlike our primate cousins who uttered single sentences, we combine words together to express complex ideas and relationships. How do we do it? We combine these words together using something called syntax and syntax are what? These are rules of combining the words together and this language, this combination of words with sentences forms the language which help us in transferring ideas between people. Now, psycholinguists, they suggest that each sentence has three levels of processing, the conceptual level, the syntactic level and the phonological level. Now, sentence production starts with intended message, then syntactic conversions and then spoken sentences. First, one has to think, then use grammatical rules and then find the pronunciation of it and then speak the word. In sentence comprehension, we first understand the spoken speech, later on break the spoken speech into its constituents as to who is the subject, who is the verb and who is and what is the verb and what is the object and then from there take out the intended message. So, most sentences have three levels of processing. The first level is called the conceptual level, here is where the intended message is formulated. We organize our thoughts into concepts that we have name for. So, what we do is the thoughts that we have, we make an organization of it thoughts 
of these thoughts that we want to transfer to people into concepts that we know of and these concepts are represented by words. So, we express these thoughts in words. Now, we search the mental lexicon. So, first what we do is the intended message, we organize the thoughts into concepts that we know. Then we search the mental lexicon for words to match up the concept. The lexicon store, uh, in the lexicon store we have the abstract words of the lemma form there. All these points that there no particular order to the concepts in our internal message. So, if I want to write a sentence, clown rides bicycle or if I want to express rather writing this, if I want to express the idea that I see a clown riding a bicycle, if I want to express this idea that I see a clown riding a bicycle, So, I see a clown riding a bicycle and I want to express this idea or share this idea with other people. What do I do? At the conceptual level, I will the picture of a clown riding a bicycle is transferred into words. So, at the conceptual level, what will I have? I will have three things, ride, clown and bicycle. As I said at the concept, conceptual level, what happens is you just search or you just come up with words to express the thoughts that you have. So, conceptual level thoughts that people have or they want to share is converted into words which mean something. Now, at the syntactic level, so once I have this ride, clown and bicycle, now this have to be arranged in a particular format, in a particular way, in a particular sequence and as you can see, so at the conceptual level, the intended message event plus participant ride, clown, bicycle. So, the event is ride and the participants are clown and bicycle. So, at the conceptual level what I need is what is the action and who are doing the action. So, here clown and bicycle are doing the action and the event is riding. So, then once this is done, so how do, how do I make this thought of a clown riding a bicycle? into this kind of structure ride clown bicycle is through assigning thematic roles. Various participants in the event of thematic roles as you can see the clown is the agent because he is the one who is riding the bicycle. The unicycle or the bicycle is the patient. So, what I have done is I have interchangeably used unicycle and bicycle. So, please adjust to that. And so, this unicycle is the patient because that is the one which is ridden, agent is the one who is the person who is riding and ride is the action that he is doing. So, what I do is then the clown has the thematic role of subject, the unicycle has the thematic role of an object and ride has the thematic role of a verb. This is assigned. Now, agent causes the event and patient is acted upon by the event. So, each sentence then it is some kind of event or state of affair. So, sentence expresses some kind of event or affair and the nature of event is defined by the kinds of participants involved in the event. The agent is the entity that causes the event portrayed in a sentence to occur. So, the entity which makes the uh, sentence occur is called the agent. The patient is the entity that is acted upon in the event that the portrayed in a sentence. So, this is the one in which the act action is being happening on. And so, what is thematic role? The various type of uh, participants involved in the event portrayed in a sentence is called thematic role. So, basically the role that these objects in a sentence are assigned is called the thematic role. So, at the first level the thought is converted into conceptuals or concepts and these concepts are then arranged according to or assigned thematic roles or what role they are playing. As you can see ride, agent, patient, clown, cycle, this is the subject, this is the object and this is the verb. Now, what happens at the syntactic level? At the syntactic level roles are assigned, syntax. 
a set of rules for ordering words into a sentence. So, what is syntax? It is basically a rule, a kind of rule which tells you how to uh, arrange the sentence. So, at the syntactic level, the language forces us to put our thoughts into some kind of an order. Now, each language has its own typical sequence of sentence elements, but the canonical word order for English is subject word object. Now, different sentences will have different rule, but English generally has the rule of SVO, we are subject verb and object in the same manner in each sentence. Most sentences or all sentences in English will have this kind of a word order and this is called the canonical word order in English. The mapping of thematic role onto the syntactic position such as the subject and object is called thematic role assignment. So, the agent assigning the agent the role of subject and assigning the patient the role of object is basically an ride, assigning ride the role of an event, the verb as event, this is basically called, this process is called thematic role assignment. Now, referring to our earlier example, ride, uh, ride clone, ride clown unicycle can now be assigned this kind of an order. So, you have ride, this is ride, this is the verb, agent which is the clown becomes the subject, so clown, patient, unicycle is the object and becomes the unicycle, so clown ride bicycle, this is the proto sentence, the basic sentence that anybody can get. So, canonical word order in English, typical sequences of sentence elements, in English this, uh, the subject verb order is the canonical sequence. Now, thematic role assignment, mapping of thematic roles onto the syntactic position, so assigning this kind of a role, so this follows the SVO format, we have the subject verb object, so S V O and this kind of arrangement is called the thematic role assignment. Now, for example, agent subject is the clown and patient object is the unicycle. Now, once we have assigned the thematic roles to the various agents and patients or actors and events in a sentence, we need to satisfy the grammar, grammatical rule also for the sentence to be correct. Now, this kind of assignment is the second step in syntactic uh, uh, syntactic level identification of a sentence. So, we need to now add some inflectional suffixes and functional word to satisfy the rules of grammar. Now, we have to add certain rules to grammar, certain grammatical rules to the sentence because clown, ride, bicycle or unicycle rather this is not a sentence, this is a proto sentence, it tells you what the subject, verb and object are, but this is not a sentence by any means. It needs some inflectional uh, suffixes, uh, functional words to be arranged in a certain manner that it becomes a sentence and so this is what the sentence is and so this happens at the second level. So, subject first of all singular or plural just one, so clown. So, we looked at the subject, now since this is singular and so we leave it as clown. Now, if the clown has been mentioned earlier in the sentence, now we assume that the clown has been earlier mentioned and so we add uh, the uh, the which is an article and the article says that this particular noun has been expressed previously in the sentence. So, that is why it is and so clown becomes the clown now. Since this clown has been already mentioned and so yes and so we add it. Now, we now do a little bit of fixing of the verb. Now, whether the verb is the present tense in the past tense, in this particular sentence clown ride bicycle, it is in the present tense, so ride will be the actual verb lemma or the actual word form. Now, subject agreement, whether the verb um, agrees with the subject, the subject is clown and so if I add s to the subject, it becomes clowns and in those cases, when I add s to clown, it becomes a plural and then ride is ok, but the moment I add s to the verb here, so if I like rides here, it becomes or it, it agrees with the single clown or the single subject. So, what I do is subject agreement, yes, so add s, ride becomes rides, so clown rides and when I put an s here in, in, in my uh, verb, it agrees with the singular subject. Object singular or plural, just one, so this is the unicycle, already mentioned, we assume that it is not already mentioned, 
and so we add a because that particular bicycle we are talking about and or unicycle we are talking about unicycle is the unicycle and so this is what it is. So, what we did was we are uh, we assign these words and match these. So, the clown rides a unicycle we add a s here we add the here a here and that changes the sentences. Example. So, we uh, took this example. Now, the syntactic position subject, verb and object are phrases and not words. So, subject, object and verb are phrases and they are not um, just words. Noun phrases subject, object, determinant and adjective. So, we have a noun phrase here and we have a this part of it is called verb phrase. It will have a verb and a noun phrase and in this case we will have a uh, noun and uh, a subject and an object a determined adjective and verb phrases main verb auxiliary verb and so on and so forth. Now, once we have this kind of a and so if, if we look at in terms of phrases. So, if we divide it in terms of phrases we will have something like this we will have subject and we will have the noun phrase. So, we will have uh, the subject the object the determinant adjective all fall under the noun phrase. So, we will have subject phrase and the verb phrase and within the noun phrase we have the determiner and the noun and so, the determiner is the the noun is clown within the verb phrase we have the main verb which is rides then we have the noun phrase here and the noun phrase has a determiner which is a and then the noun which is the unicycle. Now, this is the second step where assigning not only grammatical rules, but we are also adding things in into the proto sentence to make it a perfect sentence make it a comprehensible sentences. Now, the syntactic sequence now goes to the phonological level where it is spelled out in terms of syllables and stresses. So, that it can be articulated. So, at the phonological what happens is syntactic sequences get spelled out the syllables span word boundaries for example, rides a ride and the these are the two things it, it also looks at stresses for example, clown the stress is on clown and rides a and unicycle unicycle. We also look at persodic contours we also uh, add persodic contours uh, to it how we should be speaking uh, this sentence and so we start mildly and peak at the u at unicycle and drop sharply after that. So, we start like this the clown rides a unicycle that is how the prosodic meaning is the crown rides a unicycle that is the prosodic form of it. So, we have ride agent patient this is the clown this is the uh, unicycle first level second level we have the subject verb and object. So, clown rides unicycle this is the syntactic thing and so assigning syntactic grammatical uh, structures the clown rides a unicycle and this is the phonological level. So, the clown rides a unicycle because we need these boundaries and then this is the prosodic level which is how do we say the sentences. Now, syllable uh, the syntactic sequence now goes to phonological level where it is spelled out in terms of syllables and stresses so that it can be articulated. So, that happens now syllables separated by hyphen and stresses in a capital and so it becomes the clown the clown rides a unicycle we are expressing that kind of a thing. So, drop is after u the sentence is spoken in a single prosodic phase and so it is spoken the sentence it is not broken down into too many prosodies one single prosodic phase uh, start sentences with fundamental frequency of uh, my voice at a medium level then it rises through the course of single sentence uh, reach the unicycle which I want to emphasize and after that the voice falls. So, this is how the sentences are. Uh, so, it is not only just the uh, uh, the noun phrase and verb phrase or <laughs> subject uh, object and verb or uh, the idea of agent and patient of how uh, this kind of structure or syntactic structures are we can have all these kind of arrangements or all these kind of categories for expressing sentences. So, subject noun phrase verb phrase as I said the clown rides a unicycle determiner noun verb this is the verb phrase. So, verb phrase has verb plus noun phrase and noun phrase has subject, object, determiner, adjective if possible and so this is how the sentence actually looks like. We also have active and passive vices. So, subject when the sentence is about and focus of attention is the subject. 
So, uh, uh, if we, we can also translate this sentences into active and passive wise for emphasizing certain facts. And so, if we have active wise, the agent maps onto the subject. Now, if the agent maps to the subject, this generally is called active wise. And so, here we have the clown rides the unicycle. Now, if in this case the agent is mapping to the subject and the patient is mapping to the object. If we reverse the sequence and map the agent to the object and the patient to the subject, my sentence becomes the unicycle is ridden by the clown. And so, I have passive wise, the clown rides the unicycle, the passive wise, the patient maps onto the subject, the unicycle is ridden by the clown. So, I can change this, this for putting more emphasis on the unicycle and less emphasis on the clown. In this case, I am putting more emphasis on the clown and less emphasis on the unicycle. So, I can have these kind of syntactic structures to uh, basically come up with sentences or come up with syntactic rules. Now, grammar is extremely complex. However, psycholinguists use some common syntactic structures as these structures can shed light on how the sentences are basically analyzed. So, we have analyzing the sentence. Now, the way the thematic roles at the conceptual level are mapped onto the syntactic categories at the syntactic level. We also have something called canonical word order. So, we can, uh, we can analyze the sentence by using either the thematic role assignment. We can also look at the canonical word order of how a sentence is. So, the sub, uh, subject noun phrase, verb phrase, object noun phrase of how the sentence is divided into. And the sentence consists of two main components. We have the subject and the predicate. The topic of the sentence is called the subject and the comment about the subject is called the predicate. Now, active wise is a, is a sentence structure in which the agent is mapped onto the subject position. So, as we saw and passive wise is a sentence in which the patient is mapped onto the uh, subject position. Now, syntactic structures tells us who did what and to whom. In addition, we often rely on real world knowledge to infer thematic role. The unicycle rides the clown. For example, if I say the unicycle rides the clown, now in this case, the th although the thematic role is correct, but then the sentence is not correct because the unicycle cannot ride the clown. And so, we, uh, when forming passive wise or when transferring sentences using syntactic structures, we have to be aware of what is possible and what is not possible in, in the world. And so, we, we have to take care of that also or take that aspect also. We have to have something called the real world knowledge. Now, there are two kind of sentences. We have something called reversible and irreversible sentences. Now, irreversible sentences which no longer make real world sense if agent and patients are swapped. Uh, subject and object position. For example, the clown rides the unicycle, the unicycle rides the clown. In this case, real world knowledge says that this is not possible and so this kind of sentence is called irreversible sentences. They generally are meant to be read in a particular way. Reversible sentences are those sentences which still make sense but with different meaning if agent and patient swap the subject positions. For example, the clown chased the lion, the lion chased the clown. In this case, the clown is running after the lion. In this case, the lion is running after the clown. And so here, could be funny. In this case, it is fear that we actually uh, get. And so, how, what meaning they are making that can be there. So, reversible sentences are those sentences where we, if we change the subject object position or the agent, agent patient uh, position or the change the thematic roles of the subject object, what is really going to happen is the sentence will be valid, but the meaning changes. We can also make reversible passives. For example, reversible sentences in passive wise, the lion was chased by the clown. We can make a reversible passive wise, the clown was chased by the lion. Now, difficult to process especially for, uh, especially for young children or patients with aphasia. Now, irreversible sentences are those that no longer make sense if the agent and patient swap subject and object position. Reversible sentences that still make sense, uh, but with difficulty. Now, the clown was chased by the lion is one such an example of reversible sentences. Now, we can add complexity to sentences or we can make more syntactic changes in sentences by using something called cleft sentences. So, uh, word order not only thematic arrangement of words or thematic arrangement of roles and, and the subject verb object the canonical word order are the uh, ways of or active and passive wise making are the ways of creating sentences. Uh, we can also use a 
a technique which is called adding clef sentences for adding complexity in sentences. Now, a simple sentence that is part of a large complex sentence is known as a clause. What is a clause? It is a simple sentence that is a part of a larger complex sentence. A recursion allows us to put sentences in sentences to express the complex thought. Now, one way to build complex sentences is through the use of conjectures. We can use conjectures to make or conjunctions to make uh, uh, complex sentences. For example, we, make, we can make sentences like the clown rides the unicycle while the dog barks. And so, what I have done is while I have used while as a conjunction and this conjunction adds two sentences, the clown rides the unicycle and the dog barks. We can use cleft sentences to make complexities or to make a sentence complex. What is cleft sentences? They attaches introductory clause to the beginning of a sentence. Cleft sentences those sentences which attach a introductory clause at the beginning of a sentences and the, uh, it highlights one of the participant in the event. For example, uh, cleft sentence is a syntactic structure that attaches an introductory clause at the beginning of a sentence for the purpose of highlighting one or more participant in the uh, sentence. For example, the clown rides the unicycle while the dog barks. So, what I have done is I have and the cleft sentences. Uh, so, I can have two type of cleft. If I add, add a clause at the start of a sentence to emphasize a particular part of the sentence or a particular object in a sentence that is called that is basically in English called clefting. Now, I can have a subject cleft. For example, lion chased the clown. It was the lion that chased the clown. So, if I say it was the lion that chased the clown and change change this the lion chase the clown. So, it was the lion I am emphasizing the lion and this is basically called the subject cleft. So, I'm, what I am done is I have added this clause. Now, in the object cleft what happens is the lion chase the clown it was the clown that was chased by the lion. So, what I have done is I have emphasizes the clown in this way and this I have moved to the beginning of a sentence. So, it was the clown that was chased by the lion. Who was chased? It was the clown. So, I am emphasizing on the clown. When I say it was the lion that chased the clown, I am emphasizing the lion. So, I am using subject left and object left and can be hard to process especially when it is reversible in nature. So, interesting clauses inside of other sentences throughout the use of relative clause sentences that is placed inside another sentence for the purpose of describing a noun. Example, the lion chased the clown that rides the unicycle. Now, we can have subject relative clause and we can have object relative clause also. Now, at the heart of all the clause is actually a verb. Some verbs do not take the object, but most of them actually take one or more object. We also look at the syntactic agreements. We can also use something called uh, relative clauses for adding complexity to sentences. So, what is it? What is a relative clause? It is a sentence placed inside another sentence to describe a noun. Uh, subject relative, so I can use subject relative clauses and object relative clauses. I can add a clause inside a sentence for uh, or, or I can add a relative clause uh, to describe the noun and in this way I can make a sentence complex. So, I can have subject relatives, subject of relative clauses refers to the entity of the main clause. For example, the lion chased the clown plus the lion rides the unicycle, the lion chased the clown that rides the unicycle and this kind of thing is called the use of relative clause for making sentences. So, here what I have done is the lion chased the clown, which clown that rides the unicycle and so what has happened is I am using subjective relative clause. In objective relative clause what happens is the object of relative clause refers to the uh, entity in, in the refers to the entity in the main clause. Now, the lion mangled the unicycle the clown rides the unicycle. If there are two sentences I can add them together by using a relative clause of the object nature. So, I have the lion mangled the unicycle that the clown rides. So, what I have done is that the clown rides this particular part is called the relative clause and in this case the uh, it the, uh, the that rides the unicycle is the relative clause. So, I can use relative clause to make complexity into sentences. I can also use uh, dative constructions for making complexity in sentences and so what I can do is I can use dative constructions for example, syntactic structures expressing the meaning and or doing something for the benefit of someone else. Now, what are dative constructions? These dative constructions are structures which express the meaning of doing something for something else. For example, he gave the uh, uh, a pork to the hungry lion. Now, it requires two objects with thematic role of patient and recipient. Uh, I can have a double object construction 
in which a, a recipient plus patient is there. So, the clown fed the lion, the clown fed the lion a stick. In this case, there is a recipient and the patient and I have used the double object construction. Lion, stick are the object and clown is the subject. Now, the strong man baked the bearded lady a cake. The strong man bearded lady cake. And so, this, the here you see double object constructions. I can have prepositional dative constructions. In this case, the patient, the patient added to the preposition and the recipient. In this case, I have the recipient plus the patient. In this case, I have the patient plus preposition and recipient. And so, the clown fed a stake to the lion. This is my preposition. The strong man baked a cake for the bearded lady. Preposition, the bearded lady recipient strong man bake the cake is the patient and so I can use complexities like that. I can use complexity or add complexity by using something called agreement. Now, what is agreement? Agreement is a set of syntactic devices for linking relative elements within and between sentences. Agreement is a set of syntactic devices for linking related elements within and between sentences. Now, in, in English, the agreement is simple. Now, if the subject is in the third person and if the verb is in the present tense, then the subject and the verb must agree in number. Subject verb agreement, subject and verb agree in number. In some cases, uh, in some cases in English, the clown rides the unicycle, but the clown rides the unicycles. So, if it becomes, the noun becomes plural, the verb immediately drops the s, but the if the, the noun is singular, the verb takes the s. And so, I have the clown rides the unicycle, but when I make plural of clown, the clowns, it becomes the clowns ride the unicycles. Right? Noun pronoun agreement, pronoun agree with the noun they refer to in number and gender and in some cases maybe in English my brother, my sister. So, my brother becomes he, my sister becomes she, my parents become they and so I can use this kind of ag agreement for making complexity. I have the noun phrase that KZ clown with the funny red wig. So, I have the dative, the, art, the article, the noun and the prepositional phrase. So, how do we comprehend sentence? So, that's the, those are the ways in which we can actually make a sentence or we can uh, add complexity to sentences and those are the three levels at which a sentence is analyzed. Now, sentence comprehension, <coughs> how do we comprehend sentences? Sentences comprehension involves two process. Understanding a sentence generally involves two process A two stage model is what is used in comprehending sentences. At the first state are syntactic analysis of sentence structure and the second state is the semantic analysis or interpretation of sentence. So, at the first stage the grammar of a sentence, the structure of a sentence is analyzed, at the second stage is the meaning of a sentence is analyzed. So, two step process in sentence identification and sentence comprehension. Comprehending sentences involve a syntactic analysis of the sentence structure and b a semantic interpretation based on meaning of individual words and the way that the structure relates them together. So, not only understanding the grammar of it, the structure of it, also understanding the meaning of the sentences which is different from the meaning of each word in a sentence. So, how these words which have their own meaning, they are combined together using certain rules to form a different meaning altogether. So, the sentence may have a different meaning than the word which is used in a sentence. So, that basically is uh, the way in or the rule or the model of sentence comprehension. Now, generally speaking, there are two models which are there. One is called the two-stage model of sentence comprehension. Sentences analyzed for its syntactic structure. Now, in the first stage, the two-stage model. In the first stage, what happens is the sentence is analyzed for syntactic structures and in the second stage, the lexicon is constructed or consulted for meaning. So, first grammar is taken out, then mental lexicon is, uh, is asked or is, is referred to get the meaning of the sentence. Now, I can also have something called constraint based one stage model of sentence comprehension and so what is it? A syntactic structure analysis and a semantic ana interpretation happens at the same time or in parallel. So, syntactic analysis and semantic interpretation occur simultaneously influencing each other. So, two basic ways of sentence comprehension. The first way saying that there is a sentence analysis or syntactic analysis or the analysis of 
the grammar in which the sentence is written, the word order in which the sentence is written. At the second uh, level, the basic words are picked out from this word order and then a meaning of these words are derived from the mental lexicon. The one stage model says that it is a constraint based model which says that both the processes of understanding the syntax or extracting the syntax, extracting the rule of how the sentence was created and what is the meaning of the sentence, they happen in just one uh, sentence or just one step. Now, consider this particular statement, while Sarah bathed, while Sarah bathed her baby played on the floor. Now, what is the sentence like this? We assume baby was the object of bathed and what about played? Now, sentence comprehension model sentence comprehension, this model of sentence comprehension gets its evidence from something called the garden path model. The garden path model is a very good model which actually tells you or gives you an idea of how a sentence is actually processed, what is the way of processing a sentence. Now, the garden path model has two stages, the two stage model how to explain garden path sentences first syntactic analysis, second semantic interpretation. So, we use heuristic mental shortcuts to analyze sentence quickly. Now, the garden path sentences, it deviates significantly from expected structure making it difficult to process. Generally speaking, the garden path model says that first there will be syntactic analysis and then there will be semantic analysis and so what we generally people tend to use something called heuristics or mental shortcut to analyze the syntax quickly or if there is a problem in syntax, they will read it back. Now, garden path sentences are those sentences which deviate significantly from the expected structure making it difficult to process. Look at the sentences, while Sarah bathed her baby played on the floor. Now, if you look at the sentence initially you start with the uh, while Sarah bathed her baby and you believe that her baby was the object of the sentence which had a subject Sarah. Now, while Sarah bathed her baby if, and the moment you come to this place played on the floor this part of it is hanging. So, consider while Sarah the we assume the baby was the object of bathed, but what about being played. So, as soon as the verb played is introduced here then the problem occurs. So, did Sarah bathe her baby? who played on the floor, is that the meaning of the sentence or is it the meaning of the sentence is the, the baby was playing on the floor and Sarah was taking the bath or was it that while Sarah was bathing her baby was playing on the floor or Sarah bathed her baby played on the floor. So, what was the meaning exact meaning and so that, that kind of sentence is called garden path sentences. This card, uh, type of garden path sentences gives you an idea of how sentence comprehension actually uh, happens. Now, there are some examples of garden path sentences for example, look at it because he runs a mile is nothing. If you if you look at the sentence, the syntactic structure gives you no meaning or the, the looking at the syntactic word order does not give you the meaning of the sentences because he runs some uh, because he runs a mile is nothing. Now, the actual sentence be, should be the meaning of the sentences because he runs because he runs a mile is nothing you put a comma here or we painted the wall with cracks. We painted the wall with cracks is the object. So, uh, the wall was the one which was having the cracks and painting is what we are doing, we did not paint the wall. He knew her as a young boy, I told the girl the cat scratched bill would help her and the cat returned home was hungry, the cat which returned home was hungry and that is the meaning of it, the cat returned home was hungry and so these kind of sentences are garden part sentences. What these sentences actually tell you is how the sentence is act comprehended. These sentences will tell you that they are comprehended at the same time, a parallel comprehension happens. So, at, at the time when the syntactic order of the sentence is analyzed, at the same time the semantic is analyzed on only then you can understand the meaning of it. So, how will you rewrite these sentences and make them easier to understand? You can do it by something called minimal attachment theory. So, a sentence that deviates significantly from expected structure making it difficult to process is known as a garden path sentence. So, what is a garden path sentences? These are those sentences that deviate significantly from expected structure and it makes the processing of those sentences difficult. Now, based on eye fixation data for garden path sentences, researchers proposed a two step model of sentence processing in which the syntactic analysis precedes semantic interpretation garden path model. Now, we first build a syntactic structure based on an apparent syntactic category for example, noun verb etcetera of each incoming word. This follows looking up the meaning of the words and then linking them uh, to the sentence. Now, when we are analyzing a garden path sentence or any sentences, we actually use two kind of heurist. We use something called a late closer heurist. Now, what is a late closer heurist? A late closer heurist is we use two heurists when assigning sentences a structure. So, when we are assigning sentences the structure, we tend to use two kind of 
heurist, a late closure heurist and a minimal attachment heurist. So, let us look at what is a late closure heurist. Now, in a late closure heurist is a syntactic parsing strategy that so late closure heurist and so what is this heuristic? It is a syntactic parsing structure that combines that continues to add new words to the current structure until unless there is a sufficient evidence that a new sentence should begin. So, in the late closure, uh, uh, in the late closure heurist what happens is a word is being read or uh, more words are being attached to the sentence to the point of time that one believes that a new sentence should start and this should be the end. So, in, in garden path sentences what happens is the processing of this sentence starts here because he runs a mile is nothing. So, because he runs this is where the break is and then a mile is nothing. In this case he knew her as a young boy, he knew her as a young boy. So, the break should be here and uh, the cat returned home was hungry as to part of it and so that is how the analysis actually happens. Now, the late closure heurist leads us to, uh, to closing a structure too early. Now, the horse, uh, for example, look at the sentence the horse raced past the barn fell. Now, make making use of the oddity in the English grammar which is known as reduced relative clause is a kind of embedded syntactic structure that allows for economy of expression, but can be extremely difficult to process the sentence. The second heurist of the garden path uh, model is called the minimal attachment strategy. So, we use something called a late closer heurist and what does this heurist actually say? We keep on adding words onto the syntax, onto the sentence till the point of time that we realize that a new sentence should actually come right that is the late closure heurist. Now, in the minimal attachment theory what we tend to do is the second heurist that garden path model actually uses is called the minimal attachment theory a syntactic parsing strategy that assumes that the simplest possible structure as in, uh, this, this basic structure or this basic heurist says that we generally use or we generally use a parsing strategy which gives us the simplest possible structure of a sentence. So, syntactic parsing strategy that assumes the simplest possible sentence of a structure, I shot an elephant in my pyjamas. Now, who was wearing the pyjamas? The speaker or the elephant. Now, the easiest uh, uh, way to look into it is parsing it in a way so that I shot an elephant in my pyjamas or I shot an, I shot an element in my pyjamas. If I look at this, this is one start, uh, one sentence. So, I shot an ele uh, elephant who was wearing my pyjamas or I could, I shot an elephant wearing my pajamas. Now, there are two type of attachment that can be used in sentences. I can use a high attachment and I can use a low attachment for making sentences or structure of sentences. Now, parsing strategy which is how sentences are parsed or how sentences are read. So, parsing strategy of attaching a prepositional phrase to the verb hence the speaker is wearing the pajama. So, if I say I shot an elephant in my pajamas, in this case I am using high attachment strategy. So, the speaker is wearing the pajama and he shot an elephant. In a low at, uh, attachment strategy, passing strategy of attaching a prepositional phrase to the object. If I do that, in this case what happens is the elephant is wearing the pajama. So, I shot an elephant in my pajama. So, if that is the way I am breaking the sentence, then it becomes <coughs> the low attachment. Now, high attachment has the simpler structure than low attachment and is considered minimal. And so, if, uh, to say that I shot an elephant in my pajama is the easiest. So, I shot an elephant if that is one break and in my pajama is the other way. So, I am using the prepositional phrase to the verb, this is high attachment, but if I am using the prepositional phrase to the object, then I am having a different kind of structure and that is called the uh, minimal attachment. So, this is my high attachment and this is my low or minimal attachment. So, subject, noun phrase, verb phrase, this is my preposition I shot an elephant in my pajama. So, I shot, what I have done is I have used the preposition here and so I shot an elephant in my pajama, I sorry I shot an elephant in my pajamas. So, I shot an elephant is one part of it, in my pajama is the other part of it and look at this one, I shot an elephant in my pajama. If you look into it, this is another, this is the break which is there and so your noun phrase, you have noun phrase and prepositional phrase, you have used the prepositional phrase to the, not to the verb, but the prepositional phrase is used with the object and so here what has happened is the shooting was done of the elephant in the pajama, but in this case what happened is the person who was wearing the pajama shot the elephant because the prepositional phrase is used with the verb. Now, in syntactic theory, the verb is considered higher in the sentence than the object. Uh, hence the name. 
Now, how do we test this minimal attachment? We use garden path model, high attachment is default, hence comic effect in one morning I shot an elephant in a pajama, how he got into pajama I never know. Listeners will use either high or low attachment depending on the context, high attachment the thief opened the safe with a stick of dynamite, low attachment the thief opened the safe with a rusty lock and so these are the examples of how the minimal attachment should be there. Now, there is also something called uh, syntactic priming. Syntactic priming is a tendency to repeat previously heard sentence structures supports the garden path model. So, syntactic priming actually basically what happens in syntactic priming is some rules are primed even before a sentence is read and so that leads us to process or parse a sentence according to those rules which we have heard before. Now, I can use uh, uh, this syntactic priming leads to something called lexical boot and what is lexical boot? It is an increase in syntactic priming when verbs are repeated in prime and target sentences supports the constraint bit model and so in lexical boot what happens is it increases the syntactic priming when verb is repeated in prime and target sentence. So, if the same verb is used in the prime and target sentences the syntactic priming actually increases. Now, sentence picture matching task respondent selects first set of pictures on that is described by a prompt sentence and frequently use the test of sentence processing in patient with aphasia. Uh, behavioral neuroimaging studies show that repeated syntax structures are easier to process. So, have a look at the reference books that I have proposed and that you will understand a little bit more about syntactic primings. <coughs> for example, look at it the experimental item from a syntactic priming task which is called the disembegated for high attachment primes. The policeman prodded the doctor with the gun and this leads this syntactically prime this and the waitress prodded the clown with the umbrella. Two sentences, two figures are there. So, you look at the figure and then you make the meaning out of it and this, this is an example of it. So, the tendency to repeat a previously heard sentence structure is called syntactic priming. Does syntactic priming support theory 1 or theory 2 model. Now, pure syntactic priming in which only the structure but none of the words are repeated suggest we do in fact process sentence first and syntax level uh, which is two stage model. Now, researchers find an increase in syntactic priming when the verb is repeated between the prime and the target sentences lexical boot suggests early load of semantics in first stage model. We also use something called anticipation to uh, uh, comprehend sentences. So, what is anticipation? As listeners we not only process each word as it comes to us, we also predict what is coming next. Now, the likelihood that a person will complete a sentence with a particular word is known as the word closure prob probability. So, we are not only when we are speaking, we are not only speaking uh, uh, for the manner of speaking, we also predict what word should come next and that is called the closure property. And what is the closure property is the likelihood that a person will complete a sentence with a particular word. For example, if I take, if I write this word, I take my coffee uh, with cream and the chances are that you will say sugar here. Now, this, this basically is called the closure property, the closure property of sugar here is 100. If I can, I can also say butter here, but the closure property of butter will be less. Now, the N400 is what is, uh, uh, is uh, one, one sees when, when semantically inconsistent stimulus is used, but P600 is the ERP component which is, uh, which is uh, elicited by syntactically inconsistent. So, if semantically inconsistent sentences are presented, you will get an N400, a negative 400 peak, but if syntactically inconsistent stimulus are presented, we get a P600, a positive 600 peak that is the 400 P 600. And then lastly, we uh, do a revisit of the Broca area to look at how sentences are perceived. Now, earlier Broca area was known as syntactic processing machines. So, traditional view of Broca area involves syntactic processing. Now, evidence is Broca's patient perform well on reversible irreversible but not reversible passes. For example, irreversible sentences the fence was kicked by the horse, the horse kicked the fence. Uh, the uh, Broca area aphasics are performing this very well, but if we have a reversible sentence for example, the cow was kicked by the horse, the cow kicked the horse, if I put something like this then they are not able to uh, process this kind of irreversible sentences. Also using the word, visual word paradigm participants tend to look at an object currently mentioned Broca's patient normal eye movement if they understand what is happening. Now, the dual st stream model ventral what stream processes semantics, dorsal the house stream they process the syntax and Broca's area regulate the plan and action. So, basically the dual stream model of sentence comprehension says that the 
uh, what stream ventral stream is the what stream uh, which processes the semantics of a sentence the dorsal stream is the how stream which processes the uh, syntax of a sentence and Broca's area is basically a working memory area which actually integrates the thing together. So, Broca area plays a role in working memory on executive functioning consistent with its location in the frontal lobe. Based on clinical evidences, it has a long belief that Broca area plays a role in syntactic processing, but recent clinical and neuroimaging uh, calls to the view in question. Now, instead in uh, Instead, new theories what they suggest that the functions of Broca area may instead be involved in working memory, executive control and pick and action planning. So, that brings us an end to today's uh, uh, section and what we did in today's section is we looked at what are sentences, we looked at how sentences are comprehended or how they are processed both not only at the semantic level, but at the syntactic level, the conceptual level, the syntactic level as well as the phonological level. We looked at how sentences are made uh, sparse and what adds complexity to sentences. We looked at how sentences are comprehended, we looked at the sentence comprehension from the garden path uh, view of sentence comprehension, we looked at what role does attachment and other factors play in sentence comprehension and that uh, gives us uh, some idea about what are sentences and how they are passed and what do they mean, and what is the structure and so on and so forth. When we meet next, we will be looking at how sentences are produce. So, we will be looking at sentence production and models of sentence production and we will uh, move forward from where we are now. So, uh, till that point of time when we meet next and uh, for this, this lecture, it is goodbye and thank you from here.